Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Amy Zarzechny. I'm an assistant professor with the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy and also the director of our Masters of Health Administration program. It is my great pr pleasure today to welcome Professor Ramona Dixon here and to welcome her back to Regina, which is also her hometown. We are very fortunate to have Professor Dixon here with us uh, today to present some of her experiences and uh, her great breadth of knowledge in this area. Professor Dixon is a Canadian, as I mentioned, from Regina. She trained as a registered nurse and held a number of nursing positions throughout Canada and the U.S. with a focus on acute cardiac care. She worked extensively with the Canadian Heart and Stroke Foundation, promoting community heart health education, and in conjunction with that, completed a master's degree in health sciences at McMaster University. Following that, Professor Dixon ran, uh, spent several years in the South Pacific, where she conducted research with the Papua New Guinea Institute of Medical Research with a focus on the health of women. Professor Dickinson settled in the UK in 1994, working in various academic institutions, conducting systematic reviews of clinical research. In 2001, she became the first director of the Liverpool Reviews and Implementation Group, which is one of nine academic groups in the UK that conducts systematic reviews of the clinical and cost effectiveness of health technologies to inform policy decisions taken by the National Institutes for Health and Care Excellence. In 2011, Professor Dixon completed a PhD in educational research with a focus on developmental evaluation of a continuing professional development program for healthcare professionals. Following from that, she has recently taken up a role as the lead for evidence synthesis collaboration and that is part of the Northwest Coast Collaboration in Leadership for Applied Health and Care Research. So please join me in welcoming Professor Dixon here with us today. Um, I'll make a confession at, at the beginning of this. I am going to talk about NICE. I actually have two confessions to make. I'll make one now and one later. Um, but the first confession that I make is part of the reasons that I still do systematic reviews because they say that in your lifetime you only have a finite number of reviews in your being. Um, when Amy talked about my work with the Canadian Heart Foundation, um, in the 1980s we institutionalized cardiopulmonary resuscitation training in, for healthcare professionals across the country, across the United States, and in many parts of the world. And we did that on the basis of no evidence. We had evidence that people's skills deteriorated. We had no evidence that said if we spent hundreds of millions of dollars retraining people every year in hospitals, that it would save any lives. And so uh, I apologize to any of you who are Catholics, but I think it's a bit of penance for me that I continue to do systematic reviews to really encourage people to look at the evidence before they implement new policies. Okay, so that's, that's my first confession. Okay, so just in terms of terms, the Liverpool Reviews and Implementation Group, you'll notice from the logo there that the I is small. When we started in 2001, we thought we would do reviews and we wanted to work in implementation. Um, unfortunately, we have um, the implementation part of our work has remained small, and maybe it's because we put it in the logo originally. Um, but it was because we spent so much time actually doing the review work that we were doing, we didn't have a lot of time to do implementation. But as Amy's pointed out, I have a new post now with what we call our CLARC, which is Collaboration and Leadership in Applied Health Research. So we're doing more implementation now. So I will refer to it as LRIG, and that's who we are. NICE is a little bit diff more difficult to define. Um, I guess you show your age and how long you've been in an institution when, in fact, um, you've seen an, uh, an institute go through three name changes. So it is now the national, I have to close my eyes so I can see it, okay? We are now the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Okay, we, start, we started out as the National Institute for Clinical Evidence, e Excellence, then we went to the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, and with the passing of the new Health and Co Social Care Bill in the UK last year, our name is now changed, the, the, the name, it's not my name, their name is now changed to the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. I'm not going to talk a lot today about those policy changes that are happening in terms of that new Health and Social Care Bill, except to say that they are extensive. So I think you should see where I come from. Um, the University of Liverpool is a red brick university. It's one of the members of the Russell Group, so we're not part of the Oxford-Cambridge Group um, in terms of the original universities. We're the 1800s universities. This is actually the Victoria Building. It was dedicated to Queen Victoria, and my office sits in a grass quadrangle just behind that building. For those of you who might want to visit Liverpool, one of the best things we have is some of our pubs. 
Um, this happens to be the Philharmonic Pub, which has one of the most incredible ceilings in it. And if any of you come to visit me, um, if you're female, I apologize, but you have to go and visit the men's latrines because they're made out of purple marble. And so that's one of the tour things that you have to do um, when you come to Liverpool. Okay, so an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'll encourage people here to, uh, to ask any questions. And in Saskatoon, if you've got any questions as I talk along, wave your hand and we'll stop um, to, to answer them. Okay, but, or write them down because we'll have question and answer period at the end. So I'd like to talk just a bit of an overview about what LRIG is, who we are, and, and what we do, um, besides our work for NICE. Uh, a very brief overview of health technology assessment and how, it, how we fit into that within the UK. And then spend most of the time on the NICE appraisal process. And I'll be defining things like multiple technology appraisals and single technology appraisals as I go through the, through the talk and how, how that fits into the NICE process. I have, um, because Alan Wishart did such an excellent job, I have a 12-minute video, which is part of a, a program that was published a couple of years ago, which actually demonstrates and shows you what a NICE committee looks like. And it is very, though it's 2009, it doesn't look much different today. And I think it's just such a good explanation. So we're going to be showing that video in the middle. OK, so this is the LRIG team. Um, you'll notice a preponderance of females. We are working really hard to develop and have more males in our group, um, but not necessarily succeeding. So who are we? Well, we were established in 2001, um, and we have a Department of Health contract to deliver the equivalent of five technical appraisal reviews a year. Now, a technical appraisal review is considered one systematic review that includes both clinical and cost effectiveness, which includes economic modeling. Okay. And our workload is, is broken down under these TAR units. And when I talk about single technology appraisals, we don't, when I talk about multiple technology appraisals, that's a full TAR unit for us, okay. just to put that in perspective. We are incredibly fortunate for any of those of you who will work in research in that we work on a five-year research contract um, and we're currently funded to 2016, and we've just gotten approval for our funding to 2021, which is almost unheard of in the research community. The Department of Health has done that for a number of reasons, and the most important reason is, is it keeps in place, because we're one of nine groups, it keeps in place full core research teams that can do their work. Uh, we're also fortunate that our contract is for five TAR units a year, and we get paid even if we only deliver four. And that's because they want to make sure that the capability is there. Not all of our work is done for NICE, and we are contracted to the Department of Health, but we deliver work for NICE, but we don't work for NICE, which means that NICE cannot this cannot influence directly our reports. They can try, but they can't. So we, and it's also a benefit to NICE because they can say that they have um, independent academic re research groups looking at the, the evidence. Okay, so that's the first part of that. We also supply uh, support to the National Health Service staff who may want to look at what they're doing in terms of implementation of practice. So we've done that. We've been working, for example, with some reading groups delivering dementia projects. Um, we have a thing called the Reader Organization, which is promoting reading within um, delivery of care for Alzheimer's patients. And so we've done some qualitative work. That's just an example of that. We do um, supply mostly health economic support to trials that are running. So we're working with a couple of breast cancer trials right now in, in the Manchester area. And obviously, the, the other work that we do um, and this picture is my second confession. Because the reason I actually got invited here is because, um, you know, what back when I said that we don't have to actually do all of our review units in a year, I can often tell when we're going to have a gap in our work program because, as I explain what single technology appraisals are, you'll see why that happens. Drugs don't get approved. You know, we've been set up to do the appraisal. We don't have to do it. And it was pretty obvious two years ago we were going to have quite a significant gap in our work program. And so as a group, we decided to write a book. And we have a strong belief that systematic reviews are a really good tool for students doing master's degrees to do their thesis. 
and I come from that, from running a program for a number of years where we did that. But we found that there wasn't any support systems for people doing that. There's lots of excellent books on how to do reviews. There aren't a lot of books that say, if this happens, you know, if you get a thousand hits, what do you do? If you only get 50 hits, what do you do? And so, as a group, we contracted and wrote the book. So our actual connection to the University of Regina came because of the book. Someone from here who sent me a paper to say, oh yes, I had that problem, and here's the paper I wrote about it. And then the link came and the invitation for me to come and speak. But when we looked at who the audience might be, we decided that actually policy and what NICE does would probably be far more interesting than talking about the book. But I have to tell you that we wrote the book, and I think it's wonderful. And it's, it is about a journey, which is why it has a red truck on it. Uh, so those are some of the other things that we do. We also support, for those of you who know um, the, the work of the Cochrane Collaboration, we work with two program grants, um, people in two program groups, we work with the epilepsy group in terms of helping them complete their reviews and the airways group and completing their systematic reviews. So what we try and do is, is give the people who work in our research group a broad spectru spectrum of work to do so they're not always working on nice work because I think you'll see as I described our nice work. Um, sometimes it's always not as nice as it could be. We currently have 16 people on the team, uh, equivalent of 10 FTEs. We run an annual budget of just under a million pounds. And as I said, we're one of nine groups in the UK. Now, historically, until 2011, all of those groups resided within universities. But as of the 2011 contract, there are now two private groups that run uh, that that form those, those research groups. One of them is, is part of the BMJ, uh, the British Medical Journal Consultancy Group, and the other is Jos Kleinen's group out of um, Holland, and out of York and Holland. And that's caused some interesting um, dilemmas. The directors of the nine groups meet twice a year, and as research groups, uh, we also run two workshops a year for all of the staff that work within the groups. And we've discovered that um, one of our private groups is not quite as sharing as some of the academic groups might be. And so it's caused some interesting challenges. But we still do run really, really interesting workshops. We work, all the directors work collaboratively together. Um, we, share, we share the workload, we share the ideas, and we try and look at things that are upcoming that will be issues. So the Intertask workshop that is going to run in July is looking specifically at the work of information specialists as, as they work within the review groups and how they're identifying uh, studies now that we're no longer just searching Medline and, and, and the standard databases. You know, how do we get our studies out of Google? What kinds of things can we do? Where should we be looking for this broader data that we need? So the information specialists are a really important part of our group. Um, and as part of that, we have Tom Jefferson coming to, to speak with us. And I'm not sure if any of you have been following the um, the drama of Tamiflu and the review that came out on Tamiflu where the original report looking at aggregate data said that Tamiflu worked and when they actually got down to it and tried to get to look at the data, they found out that the authors of the papers, the original papers in Tamiflu had actually never seen the data. It had been provided by the manufacturer and the authors had not actually done the analysis and when the reviewers actually got the data from the manufacturers. Um, the findings related to Tamiflu were reversed, so showed up that the UK government had paid 500 um, million pounds and to stockpile Tamiflu, and it wasn't worthwhile. So um, these reviews are important. Uh, there's lots of important things that come out of them, and there's there's lots of things to be done. So sorry, that's just a bit in the side. Um, in terms of our expertise within the group. We have people who, we call them clinical reviewers, but they're actually systematic review methodology specialists. We have an information specialist who works not only with us, but also works with our partners in the NHS. We have two medical statisticians, a junior and a senior statistician. And by, by choice, we share those statisticians with um, the medical stats department, and that allows us to, to dip into other expertise in the medical stats department if we need it, if it's beyond what our two people can do, and also because we have a belief that people need to continue to work within their own specialty if they want to stay at the best in their specialty. So we don't just pull them in to do work with LRIG, they continue to work within medical statistics and keep their, um, their expertise broad. We have uh, a health economist and two economic modelers. 
We also have an agreement that we work with Brunel University in economic modelers in Brunel, and more recently, um, some health services research economic modelers from the University of Lancaster. So the group is quite broad. Um, just for those of you who care, most people work at home. Um, they work and come into the office two days a week. We, we live in Liverpool, we work in Liverpool. Three of our people live in Yorkshire. Two of them, three of them live in Wales, and three of them live in Cumbria. So they travel a lot, we do a lot electronically. As you might have noticed from that list, we don't have any clinicians. Uh, we have no physicians as a part of our group. So how do we get clinical expertise in to, to give us information when we're dealing with projects? And the way we do that is that every project that we have, we set up a clinical panel. And that panel is made up of a coordinator from, from the review group, usually one of the methodology reviewers, okay? um, one, a medical statistician, a health economist, and a modeler. And we then go to, we start with our university portfolio of clinicians to see if they will provide the clinical expertise that we need to do whatever project we're working on. And we're very fortunate at the University of Liverpool, we have cross um, appointments from the National Health Service into the university. And that means that the clinicians should be doing work within the university. The majority of them don't. And working with us provides them with a really good opportunity to fulfill their university contract. And not only that, if they work with us, they get to look at manufacturers' submissions of new treatments and see what's coming down the pipeline, and so they're happy about that. And in the last instance, it often means that they can publish a paper, and they're very happy about that. I'm not sure. I assume that you have the same system here, the, the publisher parish. We've just gone through our most recent, um, it's not called the research assessment exercise anymore, but it's the same thing. It decides on how much research funding you get in your university, and these linkages were very good. So our clinicians are usually excellent. We start locally to see if we can recruit them locally. And what our experts are required to do is they're required to comment on our review protocols that we write for full systematic reviews. They're required to look at and critique the submissions that we get from the manufacturers when we get projects from NICE. Um, they comment on our draft reports and depending on their input into the project, um, they also co-author papers. We also have um, a history of turning our reviews into Cochrane reviews to try and make them more accessible um, to the wider world if we've already done the work. If any of you have done any work with Cochrane, the whole concept of what the Cochrane collaboration does is fabulous. The whole concept of trying to turn your review into a Cochrane review is a nightmare. Um, it's really a lot of work and the Cochrane collaboration is going through major changes right now in terms of how it's functioning and we're hoping that that's going to make life a lot easier. But we probably, I think we have six reviews right now from the past seven or eight years that we've turned into Cochrane reviews, which just means that the work is more widely accessible. Okay, this is the big picture, and I'm not going to try and explain how the National Institute for Health and Research works, because to be honest, I have no idea. Um, this is an old slide where it says NHS trusts there. Remember I said that we have a new health and social care bill. Um, the NHS trusts have been changed over to things called CCGs, which are clinical commissioning groups. The idea of clinical commissioning groups was that uh, the people who are actually delivering the work should be making the decision about who's delivering it, and that GPs should have greater say. And what that's turned into is trying to have GPs manage multi-million dollar budgets that, I know you're going to put this on the website, but I'll say it anyways, is an area of expertise they don't have. So. They, we now have these clinical commissioning groups that have been established. They're wide. They only came into existence in April, and we're still trying to figure. They're still trying to figure out how they work, um, how they can make decisions, because most GPs can't decide how many hip replacements they should commission for next year, or how many, you know, stent applications they should have, or open heart surgeries. So they're really struggling within the system to see how that works. There is a huge movement in the UK right now that believes that this new social care bill has sold the NHS out to privatization. Um, in fact, I don't know if any of you know the, 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 the television series Waiting for God with Stephanie Cole. She was so adamant about this that she, um, they got together with uh, a number of writers and they're touring the UK right now with a play trying to promote people to stand up and say, no, you're selling out our NHS, so you might want to have a look at that. I think it's called This May Hurt a Little. I actually saw it the week before I left. It's an excellent play. 
So we don't know how all of that is working out, but that yellow, that yellow square that's on there, the research projects and programs, is where our research fits into the whole system. We go down one step. We're part of the NIHR Clinical Evaluation Trials and Studies Unit. It's called NET-SCC. I have no idea how they got NET-SCC out of that, but they did. And we're the blue box on the right-hand program, our right-hand side, uh, down at the bottom, the Health Technology Assessment Program. Those numbers are very old. Um, I just I can't talk to the public health and SDO budgets, but our budget, the budget for health HTA program is more than double that now. Okay, and the HTA program then links with the National Health Service and the research community, and they actually have a very good way of doing this, in that all of the programs or all of the, the projects that are funded through the HTA program are required to write research recommendations. Those research recommendations are examined every year, and a prior, prior, somebody say it for me, prioritization exercise is carried out to see what they should be funding for the coming year. And that attempts to link in with the NICE prioritization program, where NICE makes decisions about what they will look at for the next year. So that's the system that we work with. So NICE. Um, I'm only talking about the first part of NICE here, with, which is the health technology appraisal process. And out of that process comes guidance and also the diagnostic program. Um, I'll come back to, to more details on those. They also have a public health program, which provides guidance about what needs to be provided in the NHS. They provide clinical practice guidelines, which are informed by systematic reviews and sometimes by economic evaluations. The other work of NICE includes a very active international arm. And sorry, did I do that and make that come up? Bottom. You want to change slides, it'll go away. Um, their international work, they are working with uh, a number of international countries, helping them set up HTA, HTA programs and, and processes for making decisions related to what will be funded. They also have a scientific advice group. And it's a very interesting group in that the scientific, scientific advice group is working primarily with pharmaceutical companies, helping them design new um, phase three trials to set the outcomes within those trials so that we will have the outcomes that we need from them, that NICE will need from them to make their decisions in the future. So that scientific advice program is working now to try and improve the data that we will get five to ten years from now for making processes and making decisions. So under the health technology appraisal process, NICE um, is an arm of its, its arm's length from the government. And they provide guidance. And what that translates to in, in the National Health Service of England and Wales is that when NICE makes a decision to say that a new treatment is approved by NICE, that means that everyone has to provide that treatment within three months of approval. So you cannot be turned down if you want that treatment wherever you are in the country. However, what it also means, if NICE turns it down, it means you can't have it, unless it's part of an ongoing clinical trial. So it is a very, very powerful decision-making body. The diagnostics program is only two years old, and they're looking at new diagnostic tools that are coming in to be, be used. The methodology within the diagnostics program is, as you can imagine, not as well developed. We've been doing the, the guidance program since 2001 and have gone through multiple iterations of how that process works. The diagnostics program is hampered in two ways. The first is, is that most of the information and research that we have on, on new diagnostics tests is quite poor. And the second is, is that trying to do economic analysis of that is a nightmare of making up parameters. Um, and so it, it is a really challenging program to work in. So for instance, we're doing a, a diagnostics um, program project right now looking at um, genetic testing and the diagnosis of uh, prostate cancer. And there are about eight pathways that could possibly be looked at in that. So our economic modeler has developed hair almost as white as mine only within three months of working on the project. But you can, the NICE website is there. All of their guidance is available. 
it's not absolutely transparent when you look at it. I've keyed it up later on. If people want to have a look at it, I can walk people through. But all of our reports are publicly available on the NICE website. All of their guidance is available on their website. So you can have a look at it. Oh, went away. OK, so as I said, the NICE appraisal process makes decisions. Sorry, you people in Saskatoon, I'm really finding it hard to stand here straight. So. I'll try not to walk away. Um, OK, a multiple technology appraisal is where we started. Back in 2001, when we first did reviews for NICE or technology um, appraisals for NICE, our job was to look at the clinical effectiveness. And the cost effectiveness was important, but not as important. And the models that we looked at were not particularly complex. So within a multiple technology appraisal, so for instance, um, I think one of our first ones was looking at thrombolysis for cardiovascular, for uh, acute myocardial infarction. Okay, so I think we had four or five drugs. We had four or five different companies that sent us submissions. It was our job to conduct the entire systematic review of the evidence in the area, make decisions, do the meta-analysis, whatever had to happen with the clinical data. And then it was our job for our economic modelers to do an economic model to say, OK, given this clinical evidence, given the cost of the drugs, where do we think this fits in? Which is the most clinically effective? Which is the most cost effective? Therefore, what should NICE say? Okay, it was quite straightforward. In fact, I can confess in that first one, we didn't even develop our own model. One of the manufacturers gave us a really good model, and we used theirs. Um, so it was quite simple and quite straightforward. But it has dramatically evolved since that time for a number of reasons. Um, one thing, the modeling has evolved. The other thing is the number of drugs that would be considered as, as has increased dramatically. So uh, health technology appraisal review that we just did on first-line treatment for non-small cell lung cancer included over 70 studies and, and had about 22 subgroups in it. So it was very, very complex. The other complexity that's been added is that a number of the drugs that we currently, that we used to look at are now off patent. So evaluations of clinical effect or cost effectiveness that we did five years ago no longer stand because drug prices are no different. So all sorts of things have evolved. But in the multiple technology appraisal process, which we still have and we still work in, um, the clinical review group, us, conduct the entire systematic review of the evidence. We develop the economic model. About six months into the process, we get the submissions from the manufacturers, which we look at. To, to make sure that we've got the most up-to-date data or they haven't given us any extra data. We will look at their economic models. And as I said, sometimes we've stolen them. Well, not stolen them, we use them. Um, but it is the responsibility of, of the review group to, to provide the entire report for NICE and what is what NICE looks at to make their decisions. The time period for the multiple technology appraisal was set at about eight to 10 months. And I guess. I should maybe step back a little to say, how do we know what work we're going to be doing? So NICE has its work program set out for the next three years. And so we know the projects that we're going to be doing for the next three years. So they've already done their prioritization for multiple technology appraisals that will be done next year. So the eight to 10 months for an MTA starts when the project starts, not when they've decided to do it. So the period can actually be quite long and can be two to three years from the time the topic is identified till it actually happens. Okay, so you can see that people thought perhaps that was a bit of a problem, that it was taking a bit too long. But in the early stages, we were looking at a number of things. You know, One of the other ones, projects that we did was on drug-eluting stents. They were a relatively new technology. Um, but that, pro that entire project, from when it was referred to NICE to when we finished it, was over two years. So rightly so. The manufacturer, oh, sorry, and that's a half of what the MTA process looks like. I don't expect you to be able to read that. Okay. I can't read it, even with my bifocals on. That's only half of the process. NICE is very process driven because they need to be transparent. Um, and so the timelines for a multiple technology appraisal run um, about 12 pages and will include things like the document will come in at 9 o'clock in the morning. It will identify who will see that document at 11. Um, it will say where that document goes by 5 o'clock. So they're very, very process driven and, and follow that process. So that's half of the MTA process. 
So as you can imagine, as newer drugs were coming to market, the manufacturers were very keen to have nice look at things sooner. And the decision was made by the Department of Health with the influence of the pharmaceutical, um, uh, the pharmaceutical agents that technology should be approved by NICE as close as possible to when they are given market authorization by, in our case, the European Medicines Agency. So as soon as, as soon as possible from when they get marketing authorization, NICE should make a decision. I personally disagree. And you'll hear from my discussion a number of the reasons I do, but it doesn't matter that I disagree because that's the decision that was made. And in 2005, we started doing what we now call single technology appraisals. And the single technology appraisal process is designed to be a single uh, product, device, or other technology. It should be for a single indication. And it should be, um, so most, and most of, therefore most of the relevant evidence would come from one manufacturer. So it would be quite limited. It would happen as soon as possible, as I said, after marketing authorization is given. What that means is that any company that's part of NICE's horizon scanning is which drugs will be at the EMA over the next year and a half. They decide that they will critique those. And you can imagine that as they do that, um, not all of those drugs, either A, their trial data comes in late, so they don't meet the deadlines. They get held up at the EMA, so the EMA doesn't make a decision. Um, or they, they don't have data at all, and they withdraw. So what happens is a lot of things that are assigned into our work program never happen. So though we're assigned to do five TAR units a year at any point in the year, I may actually have the equivalent of seven or eight on my books because we know a number of them are going to fall because they're not going to happen. But there is also the issue of is it a good idea to have that so soon because what's happening is we therefore are making decisions based on limited data. We don't get all the data that goes to the EMA and that's a different issue that other people are dealing with now. We don't get it all, but we're making decisions on new drug therapies on the basis of very small trials many of whom have not reached maturity. So we won't have overall survival data because the trials aren't mature yet. And NICE have to make decisions then on the basis of projected benefit for patients, which I, makes it quite limited to me. But the difference in the STA process is that the academic review group is not the one responsible for doing the systematic review or the economic modeling. It's our responsibility now to look at the submission from the manufacturer that presents the clinical and the economic um, information. And those reports can vary. Um, this is a single technology appraisal document. It happens to be a short one. It's only 350 pages. Um, the addendums that we, that we got on this appraisal, including the clinical study report, which we always request, is over 30,000 pages. So, so saying we don't get all of the data, we still get a lot of data to look at. Okay, and it comes from the manufacturer. The manufacturer also develops the economic model that goes with that. So it's the work of the, what we're now called the evidence review group, the ERG. We critique the clinical evidence to say, do we think this is true? Okay, do, do, of what we received from the manufacturer, you know, do we think that's appropriate? Have they given it all to us? Is there other data that they should have given it to us? And then it's the job of our economic, our modelers, to do what they you know, very technically call model busting, which is taking a look at the model that's been submitted by the manufacturer, test out the parameters that have gone into that model and say, do they make sense? And this is where our, clinical, our clinicians are so critical um, to, the, to the whole project. Because before we start a project, we ask the clinicians to come in and walk us through the standard pathway they would expect that patient to go through. And then we have to compare that to the pathway that's used in the economic model provided by um, the manufacturer. And then we also have to critique whether or not the actual costs that are put into that parameter make sense. And I'm much more cynical about manufacturers and manufacturer submissions than I was in 2005. I started out quite cynical, I have to say, but I am more cynical now than ever. 
Um, on more than one occasion, I've had the modelers from the manufacturers actually say to me, um, sorry, this is in, in, we did a project looking at the fir first 30 STAs that were done um, within NICE and found that the manufacturer's submissions were actually not very good. They were hard to read, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in, in discussing that with the, with the people who submitted them, actually speaking to the health economists and the modelers who had worked on the models who were, who were told, this is the cost of the drug. This is the incremental cost effectiveness ratio we want at the end of the day. Make it happen. And that's what they're told. And they make it happen. Um, so it's our job to make sure that that happens in some kind of a logical format. And I can, I can honestly say that it probably only happens logically in about 20% of the cases. Our modeler is, our modelers are, are excellent. And so it's our job to lay out for the NICE committee um, where we think the model is strong, where we think perhaps there have been some assumptions made in the model that aren't correct. And we, I have to say we found errors in both directions where, where we've been able to say, no, actually, we think we, you've underestimated this, and it's a bit different than that. Um, now, to do that, we have eight weeks. So on, on day one, week one, we receive the manufacturer's submission, which is a document like this, plus its references, the economic model. We have two weeks in which we can, our team reads this, works with our, clinic, our clinical uh, reviewers, and we have two weeks to define the clarification questions that we wish to ask the manufacturer. As, as you can imagine, some of the things we want to know aren't always in their submission, and so we ask for clarification on those. As I said, we always ask for the clinical study report for the CSR, even though there's a lot of information in there, sometimes there's more information than we need. We also ask for the original protocol, so we can compare whether or not the statistical analysis they did is what they said they were going to do. Um, so those all come as part of the clarification letters. So we have two weeks to write that. The manufacturer then has two weeks to respond, so we're now four weeks into the process. While the manufacturer is responding uh, to that time period, we're writing the background part of our report, um, trying to outline for the committee we work on the assumption that the committee is not going to read the manufacturer's submission, so we need to make sure that there's enough in our report that the members of the committee um, have an, an, over, an overview of what's in it. So we work on that for two weeks. We get the clarification responses back from the manufacturer. We spend two weeks integrating those into the model, um, writing our draft report. We have one week. We, at the end of that two weeks, the, the document is looked at internally by all the members of the group, not just the team that worked on it. Um, we then have one week where it goes out to external peer review, and then we have three days to finish it up and send it to NICE. So it's a very tight timeline that we have to do this. The next part of the process is that um, the report goes to NICE. It goes out for consultation. Um, the manufacturers get to see it. They get to send us a factual error check. And we've had factual error checks that have gone as, as high as 60 pages. Most of them aren't usually factual error checks. They're usually differences of opinion that the manufacturer doesn't agree with what we wrote. And then it goes to committee. So that's our part of that job. That's what a single technology appraisal looks like. Much simpler, shorter time frame, but the, the actual document looks the same. You know, comes in at 9, goes out at 5 kind of thing. Okay, so I said it goes to the NICE Appraisal Committee. Well, what's the NICE Appraisal Committee? Well, their job okay, is to interpret the evidence on the clinical cost-effectiveness, okay, the health technologies, and to give recommendations. And you can tell from the wording that this comes directly from the NICE website. Um, the members are expected to apply their expertise and their judgment and their individual backgrounds to the topic, and they help the Institute make some of the most decis difficult decisions of their public life. And actually, that is true. It is a very difficult process. So there are four appraisal committees, and they meet every month. Um, two of them meet in Manchester, and two of them meet in London. Each committee is made up of between 25 and 30 members. The members are drawn from the National Health Service. They're drawn from patients, from carers, from the academic world. They have health economists. They have statisticians. Um, the members of the committee are volunteers. And they volunteer because it looks, A, two things. One is they get to work with NICE, 
and B, it looks good on their academic portfolio to say that they've worked at NICE. And then they realize how incredible amount of work it is. And some of them have stayed a, a long time and we have some really, really good committee members. But it is, it is a very time consuming job for them to do as volunteers. Each committee has its own designated chairperson. And at each committee meeting, there will be two clinical experts that come to give opinion to the committee. These will be external experts. Uh, and they answer any clinical questions that arise as a part of it. There is almost all, I, I can't, I've never been to a committee meeting when we have not had a patient representative. Uh, and, and the patients are questioned by, by the committee about their thoughts around the, the, the new treatment, et cetera, et cetera. And more recently, the manufacturers have been allowed to come to the committee. Committee meeting takes place in two parts. And you'll see when we, I show you the video how that works. But essentially, at the first part of the meeting, all of the key issues are addressed. So there will be two members from the committee who are assigned to present the clinical evidence out of our report. And there's usually a clinical person and an economic person. And they summarize for the committee the review group report um, and, and highlight what they think are the discussion points that they want the committee to deal with. We meet in a telephone conference call with the chairman of the committee, the NICE people, technical appraisal team from NICE, um, and those, those representatives in a telephone conference call, usually two weeks before the meeting, to make sure that we're happy with all the issues that they brought out or if there's anything that we need to provide for them. So all of that discussion happens in the early part of the meeting. The meeting is then closed, and the public is asked to leave. The manufacturers may stay for a small part of the second part of the meeting if they have submitted uh, a lot of commercially in confidence data that was not allowed to be discussed in the open meeting. Then um, they, they are allowed to stay for a part of the second part of the meeting, but the decision is made in the second part of the meeting. Uh, the fact that the meetings are open, an open invitation goes out for every committee meeting that happens, and if you are visiting, London or Manchester, and you want to visit one, you can you can apply to go and, and see how the whole system works. One of the interesting things that happened when, when they opened the meetings uh, to the public is we were informed that the manufacturers had sort of clubbed together and hired a consultant. And it was the purpose of that consultant to come and profile all of the review teams and all of the committees on how they function. So, that's just a little aside. Um, okay. So, what does it look like? I guess this is a 12-minute video. Sorry, it was done uh, by Alan Wishart. The, the, if you go to Alan Wishart's uh, website, you can look at the whole thing. We're just going to look at the first 12 minutes because it really does give a good indication of how the process works. So I hope you uh, found that interesting. It is a true um, portrayal. That is exactly what the committee looks like. It is exactly the kinds of discussions they do go through. Um, they actually go through almost 60 of those discussions now every year. And that committee that worked all morning will then have done exactly the same thing in the afternoon with another day. Um, so the next stage, is, as Adam pointed out, is that an uh, um, appraisal consultation document is issued by NICE. It goes out to official consultation. It goes out to all of the consultees that are on the list. It goes up on the website. Anyone can comment. All comments are in the public domain. All comments didn't used to be in the public domain, but when some of the manufacturers uh, registered some, such some very horrific comments, you know, almost to the point of, you know, your mother wears rubber boots to the to the review groups, um, it was a decision was made that all comments would be made in the public, and now they're much more measured comments. Um, but people can do that. Um, from those comments, the um, manufacturer may come back with new data. The evidence review group may be requested to carry out additional work uh, in light of those comments or in light of the data that comes out. There is then a second committee meeting, which hopefully will make a decision, but doesn't always. And from that se second committee meeting, a final appraisal documentation that says yes or no on the drug would be issued. And again, that goes out to, to um, goes up on the website. There is then a period when um, the FAD can be appealed. 
so there are three reasons that anyone can appeal and as you can uh, appreciate it is most often the, uh, the manufacturer that appeals the one exception to this was when the Welsh government appealed over the approval of Herceptin and they appealed on the basis that they actually couldn't afford to deliver it but they did not win that appeal and of course Herceptin was approved I have another whole Herceptin story if, if we have time for it I'll share it with you related to the woman who talked about um, you know providing one more health visitor anyway um, it can be appealed that the Institute has failed to fairly in accordance with their documentation do what they should do um, their guidance is perverse and that the Institute has exceeded its powers the Institute exceeding its powers is often the one that's invoked and that's often invoked if the evidence review group has done an extensive amount of um, exploratory analysis around the model that the manufacturer doesn't think they should. Okay, there's an independent appeal panel that consists of three non-executive directors of the Institute who have not previously been involved uh, in the appraisal and two members are nominated from the patient organizations and the healthcare um, industry is considered um, at, at that appeal. There is a stage past appeal which is called judicial review an appeal costs between 100 and 150 thousand pounds to run the, the single judicial appeal that that was related to a review that we did that we did not have a lot to do with but the budget for that was close to a half a million pounds just to run um, the judicial review there are other considerations Adam brought up that the, the standard is that um, drugs that come in under a 30,000 pound quality adjusted or incremental cost effectiveness ratio are usually approved um, this also needs to include that or be sure that all equity issues have been considered and that happens in all appraisals the 20 to 30 thousand pound um, cost per quality that's used the, the people that originally set the, the cost per quality said we should really be down around 20 um, but we're usually up around 30 there is an exception to that and the exception is uh, end of life criteria and end of life criteria were introduced about five years ago and again this was pressure from groups that said that each of you value the last three years of your life more than you value or sorry the last three months of your life more than you value three months of your life a year ago and so um, cost per quality up to 50,000 pounds are considered if the disease means that the person has less than two years to live that the, there is a small patient population involved and a small patient population is considered in the UK 7,000 patients per year taking that drug no matter what they take it for and that there is at least two months life gain as a part of that so the, the process is, is complex um, how you get into it is complex how you get out of it is complex and I think I'll, I'll save that we might come back to that I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll open to questions later I might show you that other video later it's only 30 seconds and it's sort of how what it feels like to work at nice um, but I'll, I'll let Karen monitor how we deal with questions thank you very much thank you it's a fantastic lecture and I'm sure that people have uh, lots that they would like to discuss now perhaps we will open it up first to Regina and then we'll move to our colleagues in Saskatoon